Today on America's Test Kitchen, Bridget and Julia make the ultimate roast chicken with warm bread salad. Jack challenges Julia to a tasting of white miso paste. And Elle makes Bridget a quick and delicious recipe for skillet roasted Brussels sprouts. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. Zuni Cafe in San Francisco is an iconic American restaurant that first opened its doors back in 1979. But it wasn't until the late 80s when Chef Judy Rogers got there that the place got some serious notoriety. And the most popular menu item they have is a perfect roast chicken that serves two people and is served with a bread salad. And in fact, Bridget and I were there just a few months ago and enjoyed it. And it was delicious. It was delicious. There's a lot of restaurant love that goes into that dish. So it's hard to duplicate it at home. But let me tell you a little bit about how they make it. So they start with the chicken a whole chicken that's roasted. They flip it several times. After it comes out of the oven, they actually make a little slit in the skin, pour off some of that juice, then reduce it. They do make a bread salad. They take ciabatta, they cut it up into cubes, toast it, broil it. It gets tossed with that beautiful chicken drippings. We're gonna try to condense this down as much as we can, but we do not wanna sacrifice that beautiful flavor that we get out in San Francisco. All right. All right. Hello, chicken. This is what we're using here. This is a four pound chicken. Now, we are not going to roast it whole. We want it to roast faster and easier. So we're gonna butterfly it. So this is breast side. I'm gonna put it breast side down. There we go. And use my kitchen shears here. I'm gonna cut alongside the tail piece, just right along the backbone. If you don't have a good pair of kitchen shears, they are worth the investment. Not only for this, you can cut right through raw chicken bones without breaking a sweat. And let me get the other side. And that backbone can be thrown into the freezer. Once you go to make stock or soup, mm -hmm. it's ready for you. All right, there's a bowl over there. Thank you. Let's mm. get rid of that for now. So I'm gonna flip this over and then press down on the breast here just to flatten it, just like that. Now, if it's giving you a little bit of a hard time, I actually like to take a little paring knife. Right here, this is a little bit of soft bone. Just make a slit like that, and it just makes flattening it even easier. Good trick. So now, what I wanna do is season this. We wanna get seasoning, salt in particular, underneath the skin. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna take, just where the skin starts to pull away from the meat, I'm gonna take my finger and just loosen that, just like that and go down into the drumstick as best I can. Do the same thing for the thigh on this side. Start small, you can always work your way up. All right, same thing with the breast meat. I'm gonna start to work my finger right in between the skin and the meat. Just work my way down, again, releasing the skin. Loosening the skin on the chicken like this not only makes it easier to season the meat underneath, but also it adds kind of an air pocket so that skin will brown more easily. All right, so now I need to get seasoning underneath the skin. And I've got a little bowl of kosher salt here. I've poured it out of the box because you don't want to keep reaching mm -hmm. in between the chicken and the box of salt. Not with raw chicken. All right, so now I'm going to add a half a teaspoon to each thigh and to each side of the breast. And I am using a measuring spoon for that. I just want to make sure it's all even. Another half teaspoon on each thigh, rubbing it all over nice and even. A little bit more salt, but on the cavity side, one teaspoon of kosher salt. And this is where the beauty of kosher salt really comes into play. You can actually see where it's landed. Table salt does melt into any liquid very quickly. It's looking pretty darn good. Okay, a couple more things to do. Just tuck the wings. That prevents those wing tips from burning. Exactly. And now, is the legs, we're gonna turn them inward. So they were like this, now they're like that. Gotcha. Let's move over here. So I'm putting this onto a wire rack that's set over a rimmed baking sheet. I do have to wash my hands, but after that, I'm gonna put this in the fridge. It's going to stay in there uncovered for 24 hours. And that's so that mm. any of the surface moisture can evaporate in there and the salt can work into the meat. It's gonna have a beautifully juicy chicken with nice crisp mm. skin. All right, chicken's out of the fridge. Mm -hmm. It's in there for 24 hours, so all that salt has penetrated the meat. So let's talk about the other component. It's the bread salad. It's gonna start with bread. 
Now, Zuni uses ciabatta. We love ciabatta. Mm. Ciabatta is about 50% holes, though, right? <laughs> it is. So due to the cooking technique that we're going to use, we needed something sturdier that had a little bit of a tighter crumb but still had a rustic appeal. So we are using a rustic country loaf. It's gorgeous. It is beautiful, yes. Now, here's the thing. We don't want too much crust on this loaf because it's really difficult to get it to soften. Some of the crust is nice and soft. Mm -hmm. The bottom, not so much. It's just too hearty. So we are going to cut off the bottom crust of four slices. Very clever. Now we're going to cut this into one inch cubes. So I gotta cut it into one inch slices first and then cut across. What's most important is that we end up with about five cups of bread cubes. All right, so that looks good. Let's put these in here. Now, back in Zuni, they actually take that chicken juice after it's roasted and they reduce it down and they use it to toss with that bread. Mm, so good. It is so good. <laughs> We're going to do something similar. Our first introduction of chicken to the bread is one quarter cup of chicken broth. Mm, a bit easier. We're also using two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. That's to give it some nice moisture, but also the oil is going to help the bread crisp. All right, I'm just going to toss these until they're evenly coated, just like that. And now, into the pan. We're not just using a regular roasting pan, we're using a 12-inch skillet. It's exactly the right size for this job, you'll see in just a second. So this is going to go right into our 12-inch skillet. All right, if you wouldn't mind, just putting that aside. All right, so now I do want to arrange the bread. Any pieces that have that dark crust, I want them to be in the center, but the pieces that are just mostly uncrust, right, not a lot of crust, they're gonna be on the side because the chicken is going to sit right in the center. This is going underneath the chicken. So we want the chicken juices to really soften the crust. So we got most of those crusty bits crust side up right in the center. Before I put the chicken on top, I'm gonna take some paper towels, just press any excess moisture that might still be on there. That looks good, nice and dry. So this is gonna go right on top of the bread. There we go. Mm. In order to get the skin super crispy, I'm going to brush the skin with two teaspoons of that extra virgin olive oil. All right, a little seasoning right on the skin as well. This is one quarter teaspoon more of the kosher salt and a quarter teaspoon of black pepper. This is going to go into a very, very hot oven, 475. Big blast of heat. Yeah. We want that so we can really start to cook that chicken. It's gonna stay in there for about 45 to 55 minutes. I'm going to rotate the pan about halfway through. Ooh, that's a roast chicken. You can see the juice is bubbling under the skin. So that looks great. I am going to wrap this handle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I've burnt myself too many times. Yeah. We're using an instant read thermometer. We're looking for 160 in the breast meat. That looks good, but around 175 in the thigh meat. That looks great. We know the chicken is done all over. I'm gonna get this out of the pan. Oh, so tender. I'm gonna go under there with a the spatula and move it to my cutting board. There we go, and get any bread back into that pan. <laughs> I mean, look at this bread, it soaked up the juices. I am going to take that spatula and just loosen it from the bottom of the pan. This is gonna sit here for a couple of minutes. If I didn't do this, the bread would start to adhere to the bottom. Look at the color of this crouton. It's almost as if they were fried in schmaltz. Oh, because they were. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move down to the vinaigrette. Now we're starting with a little champagne vinegar in the bowl there. Mm. Two tablespoons of champagne vinegar. Yeah, yeah, but champagne vinegar is lovely because it has a very light, acidic flavor. Sure does. And we're also going to highlight that by using a little bit of Dijon. This is a teaspoon of Dijon mustard. Also, it's going to help to emulsify our vinaigrette. A little bit of salt. We have a quarter teaspoon more of kosher salt and a quarter teaspoon of black pepper. So I'll whisk this together. Now that all this is mixed in, I'm going to gradually add a quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil. So it's one part vinegar to two parts extra virgin olive oil. And I'm just using a back and forth whisking motion. It's just easier to do this, but also it's going to really help keep this in an emulsion. And that looks good. All right, couple more additions. We're adding just plain old scallions. These are sliced three scallions, whites and some of the greens. And we're gonna use this vinaigrette to soak the currants. This is two tablespoons of beautiful currants. They're gonna to start to pick up some of that beautiful flavor from the champagne vinegar. And that, as they say, is that. 
All right, it's the end of the recipe. Mm. We're gonna put it all mm. together. Start pulling away this leg quarter here and just take a knife right in there and just pull that away. So now I'm gonna flip it over. I'm gonna find a dry spot here on the carving board because that skin is super crisp. I'm gonna flip it over and then use my knife to find where there's a little bit of a line, a demarcation line. That is exactly where I should cut the drumstick from the thigh. All right, we're going rustic style like Zuni does. They mm. don't carve every single piece. All right, so now I'm gonna take my knife and just go right through that skin, right alongside the breastbone. Use my towel here if I need to. And that chicken stays hot for a good while after you take it out of the oven. It sure does. So protecting your hands as you carve is a good idea. I'm gonna pull this wing away, go in there with my knife and find where the joint meets the breast meat. For the breast meat, I like to get out the old slicing knife because we want to preserve this beautiful bit of skin. We're gonna slice these into about three quarter inch pieces. Anywhere between a half an inch and three quarter inch is great. Let's move on down to the salad. So a few additions into this arugula. This is five ounces or five cups of arugula, of course, washed and dried very well. All of that gorgeous bread that was cooked in the chicken fat. Oh my goodness. Any juices in the pan. Now, you see this little bit of juice right mm, here? Yeah. Yeah, we don't want to lose any of that good, good chicken flavor. So those are gonna go right to our vinaigrette. This is going to go on top of our croutons. Just start tossing away. I'm gonna put this right next to the chicken. Well, this is my kind of food, a perfectly roast chicken and a gorgeous salad. This is definitely company-worthy dinner. Now let's drink it in for a moment, shall we? I mean, look at that. It is just gorgeous. Can you imagine putting this on your table if you had just some friends over for dinner? You'd look like a rock star. You would. <laughs> shall I serve? Please. All right, I'm gonna start by plating some of that beautiful salad, making sure that you get plenty of those croutons. Oh yeah, don't skimp on the in croutons. In fact, there was one here Oh. That had your name yeah. right on it. I'm gonna give you some white meat here. Perfect. And then a drumstick. Oh, I love the drumstick. I'm just going right for the heart of it. The I crouton. noticed that. Mm. Mm. It's almost toffee-like. It has that sticky, chewy, schmaltzy. It's like chicken candy. Mm. All right, tucking into the actual chicken. Beautiful crisp skin on top. Perfectly seasoned. Mm -hmm. And breast meat is very, very moist. Mm -hmm. Bridget, this is amazing. Well done. Thank you so much. So if you want to make an iconic San Francisco supper, start by butterflying a chicken, then salt it and let it air dry overnight. Cut some country style bread into cubes and toss with chicken broth and olive oil. Roast the chicken and bread together in a skillet and make a quick vinaigrette with champagne vinegar, scallions, currants, and some of the chicken juices. Serve with some baby arugula and there you have it. From America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, a wonderful new recipe for roast chicken with warm bread salad. Miso paste, which is made from fermented soybeans, is a traditional Japanese ingredient that's been used for thousands of years. But it's only been readily available here in the U.S. since the 60s. Now, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of types of miso. But today we're talking about white miso, which is one of the most common. It is. It's really the most versatile in the kitchen. We do so much with it. You can start sampling. It's a flavor booster. Think of it in many ways the way you think about soy sauce or anchovies or any of these other power boosters. We use it in sauces and dressing for chicken, for salmon, potatoes, broccoli. In some ways, it's more interesting than any of the other flavor boosters. Like soy sauce, for instance, it has glutamates. But it has other things, so I want you to look for... Zing! Loud <laughs> and salty. There's a lot of salt. There's also tropical fruit notes. In some ways, the most diverse set of adjectives in any tasting. Brininess, brown butter, mango, Ooh. fermented socks. <laughs> and they're all I think I just tasted the fermented socks. And not only were those adjectives talking about the same product, but in some cases, they were talking about the same brand different people picking up in the same thing. There are hints of mango. No, it's salty. No, it's really, really kind of fermented mm. and funky. So the fermentation comes from something called koji. Think of koji as almost like the blue and blue cheese. Mm. It is the thing that is causing the soybeans and sometimes there's rice or other grains in there to break down and create new flavors. 
So, despite being called white, none of them are actually what I would call white. It's true, they're tan. Um, we didn't really see much of a correlation between flavor and color. The texture is wildly different. I mean, this one is like applesauce consistency, and this one's almost like cookie dough consistency. You're right, that looks like chocolate chip cookie dough <laughs> minus the chocolate yeah. chips. We didn't really see a pattern in terms of the rankings. Mm -hmm. Same thing in terms of aging. The winner is fermented for six months, but the runner-up was 30 days. Oh. And that's the big difference between white miso and other types of miso, is that it's not fermented for very long. And so some miso, it's two years that they're fermenting it, and obviously that gives you a lot of complexity. I will say, we like them all. Yeah, I have to say, I do like them all, but they do taste different. This one, besides the consistency, is a bit sweeter than some of the others, a bit okay. milder. This one just tastes like good old aged cheese, like a good Parmesan. This one, I think I liked its balance of flavor. It has a little sweetness on the finish. It's quite salty, but I imagine that'd be a good thing if you're cooking with it. I like this one a lot. It does have a fruity bit to it, too. The one on the end, what'd you think of that one? It's great. It has a nice cheesy flavor to it, and cheese in a good way. So I'm going to make you pick something, though, Okay. because we did have a winner. We okay. have a favorite. All right. I think this one is my favorite because it has a balance of flavor. It's fruity. I didn't quite get mango, but I could see how you could see sort of tropical fruit. Right. It has a sweet component, and then it's quite salty. But I liked that balance of flavor. But really, I liked all of them for different things. So. Okay, so you're hedging your bets. No, yeah, a little you're, bit. You're putting chips on each but, one of these? <laughs> well, you know what, actually, it's unusual to taste it straight because, of course, you don't eat it that way. So I'm also trying to picture it in soup and things, and I think the intensity of this one would serve cooking well. Yeah, I will say tasters did it the way you're doing it, but then they had soup, and then we used it on glaze for salmon. Oh, miso salmon. Yeah, that would be a little better, wouldn't <laughs> it? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to take the paper off what my favorite was. And this is Marokame. It was number three in the rankings and was a really good choice. Yeah, quite salty. Yeah, I think it was second highest in sodium of all the ones that we tested. All right, this was kind of my second favorite. So this was the tasting panel's favorite. It's Hakari. Just felt really complex and balanced. Lots of interesting notes with nothing dominant. Mm. And these two? Those were in the sort of bottom half, but again, remember, that we liked everything. The difference here is this one is thinned out. Yeah. Um, oh, you can okay. see it's in a little squeeze pouch. Oh, this yeah. also, you picked up that it's sweeter. It has some sweetness in it. It was the least favorite, but in a panel of all things we liked. And this one on the end is the Miso Master. This was actually the runner-up. But as the difference is here, they taste very different, but the overall rankings were very close to each other. So there you have it. All the misos are good, but the best one is Hikari Organic White Miso, which costs about $7.49. Back in 2008, the Heinz Company commissioned a survey that revealed that Brussels sprouts were America's most hated vegetable. Yeah, they actually used the term most hated. Well, nowadays we love Brussels sprouts. Just try to buy them at the supermarket. You can't find them. And that's because especially when they're roasted, they're charred, they're a little bit crisp on the outside and tender inside. So Elle's here. She's going to show us a much better, faster, easier way, right, to oh, yeah. get roasted. Brussels sprouts on our table. Bridget, give me <laughs> 10 minutes and you'll have the best Brussels sprouts you've ever had. All right, 10 minutes, that's fast food, oh, practically. Yeah. Pretty fast. Okay. So we're starting here with sprouts that are one to one and a half inches. No pun intended, but this is no small thing. This is very important, <laughs> this size. Right. It's better to use small ones because they'll cook faster, evenly, and they'll all fit into the pan. So trimming them is very important. Trimming will get rid of any loose leaves and any discolored leaves. Right. The next step in this is to halve them. So we want a nice flat surface to get some browning. That's right. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna finish these off, cutting off the bottom, cutting down the middle. Petit choux, tiny cabbages. Tiny cabbages. Okay, so while testing these recipes, we had two major mm -hmm. challenges. The first is that when we cooked the sprouts, this is what you get. A little dark bullseye in the middle, which basically means the cooking is not happening over the entire surface area. So what we need to do is put these Brussels sprouts in the skillet face down. A part of that uneven cooking process we found was starting in a hot pan. Mm -hmm. So starting in a cold skillet has its benefits, right? I wouldn't be able to put these sprouts in here so easily. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. It would definitely be a mad scramble, trying to get them all in without burning myself, right. without burning sprouts. But that brings me to the second issue. Okay. If you don't add enough oil when cooking, 
you're gonna get that bullseye. Okay. It's not gonna cook all the way through. So we found that when we upped the ante on the amount of oil, up to five tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil, the oil is gonna get captured inside the leaves of the sprouts. The sprouts are gonna create their own steam because we're gonna cover it. They're gonna open up and create that beautiful surface area that we need for browning. All right, lots of surface area, lots of browning. Five minutes, right? Yes, Let five minutes up. over medium high heat in a non-stick skillet. All right. Okay, so it's been five minutes. I'm gonna take the lid off. Look oh, how beautiful yeah. that is. I like where these are going. <laughs> so I'm just gonna give them a check. This is when the browning starts. So you're just starting to see a little bit of browning here. That's right. If you feel like the ones on the edges are not getting as brown as the ones in the middle, you can rearrange them. Okay. But we're doing okay here. All right. I'm gonna let them go for another two to three minutes. So while we wait, I wanna make one of my favorite variations of this dish. And we're gonna start with a Fresno chili. It's a little spicier and it's gonna give this a little bit of a kick. So I'm gonna just prep this pepper, just cutting off the stem. This is a quick preparation. Quarter that, get the seeds out, the whites out. I like a little spice, but not too intense. They and almost have a wrap. sweet, fruity flavor as well. You oh. can smell the fruitiness when you cut it, actually. Really beautiful. Yeah. And we're just gonna mince the Fresno chili. I love that you're doing this variation, really love it, but that we do have a few more available on our website. We have the lemon and pecorino, simple, elegant. Yeah. And then we have a maple syrup with smoked almonds that is kind of addictive. Oh, that's my favorite one. Yeah, I don't know if that one serves for, but you can find all of these on our <laughs> website at americastestkitchen.com. All right, so I have my minced Fresno chili in there, and to that I'm gonna add a quarter teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of fish sauce, and two teaspoons of lime juice. Classic combination there, the fish sauce and the lime juice. Yes. A little bit of heat from the chili. I'm just gonna give that a stir until the salt dissolves, and that's all set. All right. Nice and easy. So it's been two or three minutes. I've taken it off the heat. Let's check for doneness. Oh, that looks Mahogany. beautiful. That's gorgeous. All right, let me just use the paring knife to make sure they're the tenderness that we desire okay. because that's super important. All right, so, oh, the paring knife's going straight through. They're ready to go. Okay. And now I'm gonna add this chili sauce. Oh, hitting that hot pan. Oh yeah. It just came alive. It just came alive. Just came alive. Real quick. So I'm tossing it <laughs> a little. Make sure they're all covered in the sauce. It looks great. I'm gonna season it with just a pinch of salt because the fish sauce is pretty salty, so right. it doesn't eat a lot. All right, that's great. Let's plate it up. I'm ready to eat. A little bit of the green side and a little bit of oh, the yeah. brown side. So to finish this off, I'm gonna add our two tablespoons of mint. All right. Finally, two tablespoons of dry roasted, finely chopped peanuts. Okay. Just basking in the beauty of these Brussels sprouts. They are beautiful. There we are. I cannot wait. Mm. Mm. Who's hating Brussels sprouts? Beautiful roasted flavor on the outside. They're really creamy and tender on the inside. Almost like butter. I would never believe that you made that in 10 minutes. That's kind of the point. <laughs> well, if you'd like to make these incredible Brussels sprouts, start by buying one and a half inch Brussels sprouts that are cut right in half. Arrange them in a cold skillet, drizzle with oil, and cook on the stovetop. First lid on, and then lid off. Meanwhile, make a dressing with chili, lime juice, and fish sauce. Toss it together, then garnish with peanuts and mint. Oh, it's so good. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, savory, speedy, and this version a little spicy, skillet roasted Brussels sprouts. And you can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our testings, tastings, and selected episodes on our website, americastestkitchen.com. Serves for, hmm. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later. <laughs>